Hello everyone and welcome to another video. In this lesson, we will be discussing process and process variables. We will also be differentiating between a process unit, a process, and process streams. Those are very important distinctions to make when we are studying chemical engineering calculations or chemical engineering in general. So let's begin. At the top of the lesson, let us clearly define what is a process. We define a process as any operation or series of operations that causes physical or chemical changes in an input. What we are saying here is anything that causes a change is a process. For example, when you are eating, you are making changes to the physical and chemical makeup of food. So the act of eating is a process. Okay? Now let's differentiate that with the process unit. If an apparatus or equipment is involved in the process, we call that a process unit. So the thing that makes the process possible is the process unit. In our previous example of eating as the process, the process unit is either our mouth or our entire body because it is our mouth that processes the food and converts it to little bits that is basically a physical action and our entire body utilizes the nutrients coming off of the digestion process, a chemical process. So if eating is the process, we are the process unit. That's the difference between the process unit and the process itself. Now, when we represent process units in terms of what we call block flow diagrams, this is an example, the inputs and the outputs to the process unit to undergo the process are called the process streams. These are lines that are drawn to signify the direction of movement of materials in a process. So to make it clear, this entire thing is an example of a process. While the thing that is responsible for the changes is the process unit. And the input and the output streams are what we call the process streams. It's very important that you don't confuse a process with a process unit. When you are given a term that describes a change or an equipment that is used to make the change, you must be able to differentiate if that is a process or if that is a process unit. For example, if I ask you what is baking, is it a process or is it a process unit? The answer is it's a process because baking is the process of transforming your raw ingredients such as wheat flour, eggs, milk, sugar, etc. into your output which is bread, cake, or whatever. So if baking is the process, what is the process unit? The answer to that is an oven because the oven is used to pursue the changes needed to call the process baking. Okay? You mix your raw materials, you place it in an oven, and the oven bakes the bread. Baking is the process, the oven is the process unit. And with that distinction, in order for us to be uniform, whenever you are drawing a diagram such as the one pictured here, only place the name of the process unit inside of the box in the block flow diagram. So if this entire process is baking, what we should write in the box here should be an oven. Do not write baking inside of this box because this box is only reserved for process units. I hope that difference is clear. You should be able to apply that to our future lessons. Let's proceed to the definition of process variables. We define process variables as a measurable quantity in a given process of which its change can happen rapidly. So process variables are the things that we monitor in a process. The changes to the process variables are indications that something is happening in the process. Common examples of this are flow rate, pressure, temperature, and other parameters. If we go back to our previous example of the baking process, let us draw our diagram. So we have an oven, which is our process unit. And we have our inputs and outputs, which are our process streams. So we will call this the input and this the output. Let us identify what are the important process variables that we might need to monitor during the baking process in the oven. So first and foremost, if you are a baker or if you have heard of anyone baking, 
One of the most important parameters to get right during the baking process is the temperature because the temperature dictates if your bread or your cake will be baked properly. It will not be burnt or it will not be raw. So therefore, one of our process variables is temperature. Another variable that we might want to look at is the mass of our input because you might want to determine how much are you placing inside the oven and how much do you expect to have as your baked product. Okay, that's the importance of mass as a process variable. Now, these process variables in our calculations are almost always the sources of numerical values for our problems. That means that they would dictate a big part of our calculations. So it's very important that we are well versed or we understand the process variables well. Let's take a look at some of the most common examples. First, we have the trio of mass, volume, and density. I have lumped mass, volume, and density into one group because we can convert from mass to volume or vice versa using the value of the density. The density is an intrinsic property of the material. So even if you divide the material into smaller pieces, its density still remains the same. We define mass as the amount of matter contained in a substance. Volume is the space occupied by the substance. And the ratio of mass to volume, that is the density, can be used as a conversion factor when converting from mass to volume or vice versa, that is, from volume to mass. And we already know the formula for density. We are using the Greek letter rho to represent density, and it is the ratio of mass to volume. A related parameter to density is specific gravity. Specific gravity is the ratio of the density of a substance to the density of water at the same temperature as the substance. So let's say, for example, for any material at 20 degrees Celsius, the specific gravity is simply the density of that material at 20 degrees Celsius divided by the density of water at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, the genius of using specific gravity to represent the densities of substances is first, you are always referencing the density of water. Water is one of the most common substances that we are encountering, and this definition of the specific gravity lets us compare the density of our substance to the density of water. Another good thing stemming out of this definition of specific gravity is that for water at 20 degrees Celsius, the density is almost equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter or 1 gram per cubic centimeter. That means if your density units are grams per ml or grams per cubic centimeter, your denominator here is equal to 1. And that means that the specific gravity is numerically equal to the density of the substance at 20 degrees Celsius. That is how we use the value of the specific gravity. Next, flow rates are the measure of how much substance passes through a boundary per unit time. It's simply the amount of substance in the numerator and the amount of time that's passed in the denominator. Flow rates can be in terms of mass flow rate, volumetric flow rate, or molar flow rate. One of the skills that you need to master is the conversion between these three different types of flow rates. Because in any given problem, it's possible that all three are given. So you need a way on how to convert from one form of flow rate to the other. It's very easy to discern whether a given quantity is a mass, volumetric, or molar flow rate. You just have to take a look at the units. For the mass flow rate, some of the most commonly expected units are kilograms per second, pounds mass per second, kilograms per hour, and other combinations of units. For the volumetric flow rate, which you can either represent with Q or small letter V with a period at the top, some common representative units would be cubic meters per second, cubic meters per hour, liters per second, liters per minute, etc. And finally, for molar flow rate, which we represent as the small letter N with a period at the top, can be represented in terms of mole per hour, moles per second, and even in the pound mole units. What's important is if you are given a flow rate that you immediately recognize what type of flow rate it is. Next, we have mole and molecular weight. The molecular weight is a parameter that we use to convert from mass to mole or vice versa. 
It also lets us to convert between mass flow rates and molar flow rate. It also gives us the flexibility to convert from a volumetric unit to a molar unit. You just have to use both the density and the molecular weight. We define a mole as the amount of substance which contains 6.022 times 10 raised to 23 particles, atoms, or molecules. Another process variable that we will encounter a lot in our calculations is composition. Composition, much like flow rates, can be expressed in terms of many different ways. We have here composition by mass or percent by mass, percent by mole, or percent by volume. It's important that you know how to convert from one form of composition to another form of composition. We have several examples of this later. The next process variable is temperature. Temperature gives us a scale of how hot or cold a body is. We have two types of temperature, the relative and absolute temperature. We have four temperature units that are the most commonly used units. Let's classify them between relative and absolute. We have degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit, Kelvin, and Rankine. Degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit are called relative units because they are using arbitrary measures to define the scale of the temperature. For example, for degrees Celsius, the arbitrary scale used was between 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. 0 degrees Celsius was used to represent the melting point of ice or the freezing point of water. And 100 degrees Celsius was used to reference the boiling point of water at normal atmospheric conditions. That's the same with degrees Fahrenheit. So we have the scale from 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 212 degrees Fahrenheit representing the melting point of ice and the boiling point of water. Okay? Now, Kelvin and Rankine are representing absolute temperatures. Absolute temperatures are not based on any substance. They are based from provable laws of nature. The Kelvin and the Rankine scale cannot have a negative value. The lowest possible temperature in the absolute sense is zero. That's either zero Kelvin or zero Rankines, and that is what we call absolute zero. Negative temperatures can only exist in the relative scale, so we can have negative degrees Celsius and negative degrees Fahrenheit, but never for the absolute temperatures. I trust that you now know how to convert from degrees Celsius to Kelvin and from degrees Fahrenheit to Rankine. There are some equations which merits the use of only absolute temperatures, while in some cases, it's also okay to use relative units for temperature. Next, we have pressure. Pressure is defined as the force acting perpendicularly to a surface. Pressure is very important for gases as well as liquids because the behavior of gases is greatly influenced by pressure. Not so much for liquids, but they're still affected. We have two types of pressure, that's the gauge and absolute pressure. This is much like the relative and absolute scales in temperature. For the conversion between absolute and gauge pressure, we have this expression. The absolute pressure is equal to the gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. As you can deduce with this equation, the absolute pressure cannot be negative. The lowest possible absolute pressure is zero. That is the pressure of a perfect vacuum. While for gauge pressure, this permits us to have negative pressures, but only for gauge pressure. So when you have a negative gauge pressure, that is the case of a vacuum, while if you have a positive gauge pressure, that is the case for a pressurized system. When the gauge pressure is zero, that means that the pressure being experienced is the atmospheric pressure. The normal atmospheric pressure is arbitrarily defined as 1 atmospheres that is equal to 101,325 pascals or 14.7 pounds per square inch. You have to review your units of pressure because we will be using them especially when dealing with gases. With that, let's try to solve some examples. An industrial strength drain cleaner is composed of 50% water and 50% sodium hydroxide by weight. Convert this composition to mole fractions. So before we answer this problem, let me first lay out a rule of thumb. Whenever you are given a worded problem and you are given a composition in which the basis of the compositions was not mentioned, that is, it was not mentioned whether it is by weight, by volume, or by mole. 
You can simply follow this general rule of thumb. If the system is liquid or solid, the percentages given are percent by weight or percent by mass. If the stream or if the substance is a gas, then that is the only time wherein you can assume that that is percent by mole or percent by volume. Okay? That is only if there is nothing indicated in the problem. If there's something indicated, then you need to follow what was stated in the problem. Going back to the example, we have a mixture that is 50% water and 50% sodium hydroxide. And this percentage is given as percent by weight. The question is, how do we convert this to mole fractions? For these types of problems, it is easier for us if we set a basis. So what is a basis? The basis is simply a unified assumption that you can use for the entirety of the problem. The basis is basically anything that you want to assume that does not violate the problem or does not violate any of the given of the problem. For example, for this problem, an appropriate basis is we have 1 kilogram of the solution. Now, if you are asking why did I choose 1 kilogram, that's because it's easier for me to define how much of the solution is water and how much of the solution is sodium hydroxide. By choosing this convenient basis, we can then say that the solution contains 0.5 kilograms of water and the other 0.5 kilograms of that is sodium hydroxide. And that is only possible because I chose a convenient basis, 1 kilogram of the solution. Now, I mentioned earlier that the basis can be anything. In this problem, you can actually set any number you want as the basis. Let's say, for example, you want to have 1,000 kilograms solution as the basis. You can do so. When we use 1,000 kilograms as our basis, our given would just change to 500 kilograms of water and 500 kilograms of sodium hydroxide. You can even use different units like 1,000 pounds of the solution or 1,000 grams of the solution. The basis can be anything as long as it does not violate the given of the problem. What this basis allows us to do is now, I can convert the masses of my substances to their corresponding moles. And from that, I can compute the mole fractions. By using the molecular weights of the substances, we can convert the masses to moles. So for water, we simply divide this with 18 kilograms of water per kilomole. What do we get? We have 0.5 divided by 18, that is 0 0.0278 kilomole. And we do the same for sodium hydroxide. Molecular weight, 40 kilograms per kilomole. That is 0 0.5 over 40, 0 0.0125 kilomoles we get the total number of moles, that's 0 0.0125 plus 0 0.0278, 0 0.0403 kilomoles total. And from here, we can calculate their percent by mole. You simply get the number of moles of the substance, for example, water, 0 0.0278, divide that with the total, 0 0.0403, we get 68.98%. In this problem, we are asked for mole fractions, so we will not convert them to a percent. So the mole fraction of water is 0 0.6898. And we do the same for sodium hydroxide. That's 0 0.0125 divided by 0 0.0403. The mole fraction of sodium hydroxide is 0 0.3102. Or alternately, you can simply subtract 0 0.6898 from 1 to get the mole fraction of sodium hydroxide. But that's only possible for binary mixtures. Our final answers are here. That is how you convert a composition given in percent by mass to a composition in percent by mole or mole fractions. And all of that was possible by the use of a basis. You can try solving this problem again, but you choose a different basis. You can see that whatever value of the basis you choose, as long as it is in mass units, you would end up with the same mole fractions.
For the rest of the problems that we will solve for chemical engineering calculations, always indicate what your basis is. Okay? Because for some problems, the final answer would be different if you chose a different basis. Let's solve another example. A mixture of gases is composed of 12% CO2, 6% CO, 27.3% CH4, 9.9% H2, and 44.8% N2. How much will 3 pound moles of this gas weigh? In this example, we are going to use the rule of thumb that I mentioned earlier about deciding what are the basis of decompositions. In this problem, we were not told what this percent compositions are. Okay, so we are given 3 pound moles of this mixture. We can list our components of the mixture. We have CO2, CO, CH4, H2, and N2. We list their percent by mole. That's 12% for CO2, 6% for CO, 27.3% for methane, 9.9% for H2, and 44.8% for N2. If you are given this type of problem, the first thing that you should do is verify if the summation of the percentages are 100%. That will tell us if the given composition is complete or if it's missing something. So let's try to add this. That's 12 plus 6 plus 27.3 plus 9.9 plus 44.8. It's 100%. So we can say that the given composition is correct and complete. Now from percent by mole, let's convert these values to moles or more specifically, pound moles. To do this, we need a basis. And in this problem, you cannot set whatever basis you want. The only basis possible for use in this problem is the given total number of moles of the mixture, that is 3 pound moles. So from here on, you have to judge if you can use a different basis or you have to use something from the problem as your basis. So let's now determine the number of moles of substances. We do that by simply multiplying the percent by mole to 3 pound moles. For CO2, that is 0.12 times 3. And we do the same to the rest of the components. To check, let's look for the total amount of pound moles and this should be equal to 3. And we are correct. Since the problem is asking us how much does this mixture of gases weigh, we need to convert moles to mass and you would notice that there is no unit specified for our answer in mass so since we are already given an English unit that is pound moles let us continue using English units let us solve for the total number of pounds of the gas so at this point we simply have to convert the moles of the substances to their corresponding masses and we will do that with the use of molecular weights with units of pound per Pound mole. For CO2, that is 44. For CO, that is 28. CH4, that is 16. Hydrogen gas, that is 2. And nitrogen gas, 28. To convert from pound mole to pounds, we simply multiply them with the molecular weight. So for carbon dioxide, that is 0.36 pound moles multiplied by 44 pounds per pound moles, we have 15.84 pounds. And we do the same for the rest of the components. And we simply get the total mass of the system. Our answer, 72.21 pounds. To answer the question, 3 pound moles of this particular gas mixture will weigh 72.21 pounds. You would soon see that these types of problems have the same solutions. So you just have to analyze the problem for what is being asked and then execute your plan of converting one form of composition to another form of composition.
Let's have our last example. In the production of a drug having a molecular weight of 192, the exit stream from the reactor flows at a rate of 10.5 liters per minute. The drug concentration is 41.2%, it exists as an aqueous solution, and the specific gravity of the solution is 1.024. Calculate the concentration of the drug in kilograms per liter in the exit stream, and the flow rate of the drug in kilomoles per minute. Let us first analyze our problem and list the given. So it was stated that this is an exit stream of a process. Let's call that exit stream P. And what do we know about this exit stream? We know that in stream P, the drug is only 41.2%. And since this is an aqueous solution, it's safe to assume that the remainder is water. 100 minus 41.2. 58.8% of stream P is water. What else do we know about this stream? We know that this stream is flowing at a rate of 10.5 liters per minute. Based on the collection of units, you know that this is a volumetric flow rate. And based on the rule of thumb that we mentioned earlier, we know that this composition is probably percent by mass. So right out of the gate, we cannot simply multiply this percent by mass to the volumetric flow rate because they are of different dimensions. We have two choices here. Either we convert the volumetric flow rate to a mass flow rate and then multiply the percent by mass or convert the percent by masses to percent by volume and then multiply it to the volumetric flow rate. We have other givens in the problem such as the molecular weight of the drug that is 192 grams per mole. And we're also given the specific gravity of the solution, that is 1.024. We are required to solve for the exit drug concentration, I'm calling that C, sub-drug, in kilograms per liter. And the molar flow rate of the drug, that is in kilomoles per minute. Let us first formulate our plan before we proceed with the calculations. If you take a look at our miscellaneous given, we are given a value of the specific gravity. We can use this specific gravity to convert the volumetric flow rates of stream P into a mass flow rate. Once stream P is already expressed in terms of a mass flow rate, you can simply multiply that with the percent composition in terms of percent by mass to determine the mass of the drug and water. Once you do that, you can now solve for both the concentration of the drug and the molar flow rate of the drug. Now, let's execute our plan. First, do not forget, we always need to set the basis. What is a very good basis for this problem? If you are given flow rates in a problem that is either volumetric, mass, or molar flow rates, one of the best bases that you can have is use the time unit in the denominator of the flow rate. So in this case, we are given the volumetric flow rate of stream P. In the denominator, we have a unit of minutes. That tells us that a good basis would be one minute of operation. This basis allows us to define what is the volume of P. So if we are operating at a time frame of one minute, that means that the value of P is already 10.5 liters. We were able to obtain the volume of the solution just by setting time as our basis. This would help us in determining the concentration of the drug. Also, by setting this basis, we can now convert the volume of the solution to the mass of the solution. And we will do that by simply applying the value of the specific gravity. Since your specific gravity is 1.024, this tells us that the density of the solution is equal to 1,024 kilograms per cubic meter. You simply have to recall the definition of the specific gravity. Remember that the denominator in the specific gravity is always the density of water at the same temperature as the substance. Since we were not given a temperature of the substance, I am assuming that this is around room temperature. And we are assuming that the density of water at room temperature is around 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. That gives us the density of the solution, 1,024 kilograms per cubic meter. 
we can now use this to convert our volume to mass. So we have 10.5 liters. We divide that by 1,000 liters to make that a cubic meter. And then we use the density to convert that to mass. There are 1,024 kilograms per cubic meter of the substance. Cancel the units. Our product stream is now 10.5 divided by 1,000 times 1,024. The product stream has a mass of 10.752 kilograms. In reality, this product is expressed as a flow rate. This should be 10.752 kilograms per minute we were able to convert the volumetric flow rate to a mass flow rate. And all of that was simplified because we set our basis as one minute of operation. So what do we then do with this information? We now have the mass of the stream. Can we now determine the mass of the drug? Yes, we can because the given percentage is in percent by mass. So 10.752 kilograms of the product can be divided into two parts, the drug and the water. We simply multiply 10.752 with 0.412, which is the mass fraction of the drug. We get 4.43 kilograms of the drug. And for water, that is 0.588 times 10.752. We have 6.32 kilograms of water. We can now use this gathered information to solve for the unknowns in the problem. The first unknown is the concentration of the drug in kilograms per liter. If you take a look at the unit, kilograms per liter. If you take a look at the combination of units, kilograms per liter. We can immediately see what values should go into those areas. For example, in the numerator, we simply need the mass of the drug in kilograms and we already have that that is 4.43 kilograms while in the denominator for liters this pertains to the total volume of the solution do we have that value yes that is 10.5 liters so just by looking at the collection of units of our final answer we were able to deduce that we simply have to divide 4.43 with 10.5 to get the concentration of the drug and that is 0 0.422 kilograms per liter. Okay, similarly, when you take a look at the second unknown, we are looking for the molar flow rate of the drug. The units are in kilomoles per minute. This is a little bit easier because remember that our basis is one minute. So basically, you are just looking for the number of moles of the drug. We can use the molecular weight of the drug to convert from kilograms to kilomoles. So we have 4.43 kilograms of the drug. We know that its molecular weight is 192. That is kilograms per kilomoles. Solving, that is 4.43 divided by 192. We have 0 0.023 kilomoles of the drug. While this parameter simply states the number of moles of the drug, this can actually be converted to a molar flow rate because our basis is 1 minute. So 0 0.023 kilomoles of the drug in this problem only translates to 0 0.023 kilomoles per minute. This is now the molar flow rate of the drug. Okay, this problem illustrated how we play around the units of composition and the other process variables. You need to be acquainted in converting between mass, mole, and volume, both in their absolute values and in their corresponding compositions. In the next videos, we will be strengthening your knowledge of process and process variables and applying them into the material balance process. That's it for this video. I hope you learned something. Thank you for listening and as always, keep safe.